All right, it is 12.30, so we'll get started. And let's just start with a couple of reminders. So test three is Tuesday. Like always, you have 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. 59 p.m. Uh, to take it um, under course content. What we're going to go over today is on test four, so it's not going to be directly related to the test. Um, next week, Thursday, no live lecture. It will be recorded. Also, next week, Thursday, you will have two parts of homework. On Tuesday, no homework due. So just be aware of that. Um, you should see it on uh, Wiley Plus. You'll see due April 15th, part one and part two. But with that, let's get into our material today. And Tuesday, we were talking all about prokaryotic DNA replication. And today we're gonna see the eukaryotic version of DNA replication here. First, let's just start with the polymerases. And eukaryotes have a lot of different polymerases. Animals have at least 13 that we have found. Um, this table is listing the major ones, alpha, sigma, and epsilon. And if we look at what they do, alpha, is associated with the primase. So hopefully you remember from our talk on prokaryotic replication, what primase does. This will make the RNA primer because for a, um, for, for polymerases to work, they need some DNA to work off of and that's what primase does. So this will associate with uh, the molecule that makes the RNA primer does not have any three prime to five prime exonuclease activity. And if you remember, this is what's doing our proofreading. Um, so normally when we put in an accidental base, the polymerase can fix it right there and chop it right off with three prime to five prime exonuclease. Alpha doesn't have it. So if they make a mistake, there's no way to fix it. Processivity is moderate. Um, usually it will go on for about 100 nucleotides before falling off. Remember, processivity means um, like how well you're able to hold on to DNA, just moderate per alpha. So PCNA, PCNA is the version of the sliding clamp in eukaryotic uh, uh, cells. So that's what PCNA is, is a sliding clamp. So alpha doesn't um, bind to PCNA because this processivity is so poor. If we look at delta, or yeah, um, that actually might be sigma. I always forget my Greek. Um, yeah, this is sigma. Um, it does have exonuclease activity, not with the primase, very high processivity, and it does require PCNA to have that high processivity. Since it does, it does have proofreading abilities, we can uh, figure that this polymerase is a major one for DNA replication, and it is. This takes care of our lagging strand. Well, epsilon here, um, epsilon, again, is like uh, uh, sigma over here, except it actually doesn't require PCNA. It still has very high processivity, but doesn't actually need PCNA to work. And this is our leading strand. Uh, polymerase. So those are just three of the major polymerases we have. Uh, alpha is um, primer, helps with the primer. Uh, sigma here, lagging strand, epsilon, leading strand. Those, those are the main takeaways and whether it has exonuclease activity and some processivity. Now, if we look at PCNA, which I said is our sliding clamp, and here I put in the image of the bacterial sliding clamp, they basically look exactly the same, right? It's a ring-like structure um, that has DNA going right through it. 
Excuse me for a second. All right. Yeah, I had to sneeze on figure you didn't want to hear that uh, coming out of your computer. So they both look the same and they have the same jobs. They're going to loosely bind to DNA and slide around it to um, help with polymerases. The thing that puts on uh, PCNA in eukaryotes is called RFC, replication factor C. Uh, remember in prokaryotes, this was called the clamp loader. In eukaryotes, it's RFC. So it's the same thing basically, which puts PC on, PCNA on there near the primer. If poly A is there, it will kick off poly A. Remember poly A, Polymerase alpha was the polymerase associating with primase. So that gets removed, which is called template switching, because now we can have our actual lagging strand polymerase bind. And then we can start doing our lagging strand um, DNA replication. So that's what PCNA is doing. Now let's look at how we remove the primer, uh, the RNA primer in eukaryotes. And we looked at this in prokaryotes. So we're gonna kind of compare prokaryotes to eukaryotes here. So what do you need for replication? Well, you need a helicase to open up the template. That was just like um, prokaryotes. For eukaryotes, it's by a heterohexameric molecule called MCM. Sounds very familiar to DNAB, which is also a hexamer. Right, so DNAB was the helicase in prokaryotes. Eukaryotes, their version is called MCM. When the DNA opens, you'll make double-stranded DNA go to single-stranded DNA, just like in prokaryotes. And so we have a protein that will bind to um, single-stranded DNA. That's called RPA, or replication protein A. And remember, in prokaryotes, they had the ex uh, exact same thing going on, except their protein was called SSB, single-stranded binding, All right? So eukaryotes, RPA, prokaryotes, SSB. Just a little fun anecdote about this. Uh, the person who was on the head of my uh, graduate school committee, basically the person who says if I get to become a doctor or not, uh, he was the person who discovered or purified RPA. So that's always a fun little fact whenever I see RPA and get to talk about it. Um, but yeah, that's just a fun little fact about my education. Now, to remove our RNA primer, the thing that's going to do that is RNA ACE or RNA ACE H1. So H1, as shown here, and if we look at our, um, our, our DNA here, we have the green being our RNA, the purple being Paul Ada, and then the red will be Paul Delta. All right, so RNA, RNase H1 will cut all of the RNA primer except the very last one. It does not cut off the last piece of RNA there. To do that, we actually have a different enzyme called FLAP endonuclease 1 or FEN1. FEN1 will remove that last RNA primer and it will also remove the DNA synthesized by Paul A Alpha. Uh, what's interesting though about uh, FLAP endonuclease 1 FEN1 is that you will often see it overexpressed in some cancers. Um, that's because FEN1 
also is part of DNA repair pathways that aren't very good. And by that, I mean the repair pathway it's, it's a part of often leads to mutations. It's like a last ditch resort um, to repair DNA. So the idea is that these cancer cells over overexpress FEN1, which causes this mutation making pathway to happen more in the cell, which leads to more mutations. And mutations might lead to, you know, cancer cells moving across the body to go to different tissues and grow there. Right. So that's one way how uh, cancer cells can become more vicious by having an overexpression of FEN1. Now, like I said here, FEN1 is removing um, DNA synthesis synthesized by Paul Alpha. Um, primase uh, would do that for us. But why, why here, why are we removing Paul Alpha? Why is it a good thing that DNA that is synthesized by Paul Alpha is removed by FLAP endonuclease 1. Why don't we just keep that DNA synthesized by Paul Alpha? What's the logic there? Well, if you remember, Paul Alpha is with our primase machinery. Errors are to fill the gap. So there's no gap there. Um, so flap endonuclease one removes this and then removes all that. But if we go back to our previous slide, our previous two slides, when we talked about uh, polymerase alpha, it lacks three prime to five prime endonuclease activity. Does not have that. So it cannot proofread itself. If it puts in the wrong nucleotide, there's no way to fix it. So as a safety mechanism, just in case Paul Alpha put in the wrong nucleotide, flap endonuclease one will come erase the DNA by Paul Alpha, and then our regular DNA polymerase can come and, and fill in the gap right there. So that's, that's the reason why we're actually removing DNA there. So any questions so far on our uh, journey into eukaryotic uh, DNA synthesis? Uh, when you have a moment, will you upload the practice exam for exam three? There is no practice exam for exam three because this time last year, COVID happened. And so I don't actually have paper exams. Um, and the year before that, we used a different book. So unfortunately, um, yeah, there is no practice exam for exam three or exam four or the final. And all those in practice exam were just exams given out um, in my previous classes, but due to the way that everything flipped in the spring, I actually don't have those, unfortunately. All right.
So let's carry on with eukaryotic DNA replication then. And if you remember for prokaryotic replication, um, it happened at one site called the OREC, the origin. And I'll just draw that out. And when it happened, our uh, helicases DNA B just went in each direction. Can't do that with eukaryotes because we don't have circular DNA, right? Our DNA is linear. So we can't do a similar strategy. Um, also, we are way slower than prokaryotes. Our DNA replication is like 10 times slower. So they do about a thousand nucleotides a second. So we're looking at about a hundred nucleotides a second. And on top of that, we have 60 times more DNA than a prokaryote. So if we had one replication fork, you're looking at about a month to uh, replicate the DNA. Obviously that's way too slow. So we just have a lot more replication origins. We just re start DNA replication at many different sites, uh, which is what these arrows are showing. It's just showing you all the bubbles that are happening in this snapshot of DNA. And unlike prokaryotes who have their OREC, it's like 45 or I forget the exact number, but it's a certain number of nucleotides that are conserved. Uh, mammals don't have a sequence that's completely conserved but rather their sequences can be varied as long as they bind to the origin recognition complex. So ORC. So ORC um, is a protein that will just bind to different parts of DNA. And these proteins, or this protein rather, um, helps to assemble MCM Remember, MCM is like DNA B. And it also forms what's known as the uh, replication complex or the pre-replication complex in this case because we haven't quite made it yet. Now, the formation of these complexes, they are controlled by the same factors that control the cell cycle pro progress that you might have talked about in molecular cell biology. Right. So those same factors also will determine whether these replication complexes start or not. And once you have replication underway, you're not going to form any more replication complexes. So you don't accidentally copy your DNA, you know, twice or three times, right? You're just copying it once. And then replication will occur until you just hit another fork. So you start multiple times and you just run until you run into another uh, replication complex. Uh, so this is different. Well, it's, it's kind of similar to prokaryotes. Remember prokaryotes had the tertus system, right? So our image kind of looked like that where the replication would fork would stop, the machinery would stop if they ran into a TUS uh, protein bound at the TER site. They would hit it and then pause. And then they would wait for the other helicase to come around and smash into it and they would both fall off. Uh, eukaryotes who don't use that system they just rely on our replication machinery hitting each other and then falling off. Now a further complication for eukaryotes is that our DNA is wrapped around these histones. So we need to get these out of the way and what happens is during the replication as we move closer to the histones, the histones will break apart and let the uh, machinery pass through and then once the machinery has gone past, the uh, histones will just reassemble and associate with the new uh, DNA to make sure it's nice and wrapped. 
So any questions about um, what's presented here so far? Off tangent question, since it would take a month to replicate the genome, would that correlate to age then? So will we be able to hypothetically live longer? Or would it still be due to telomeres? Um, I'm pretty sure, let's let's say that you had, that you only had one um, replication site. I'm pretty sure you won't live longer because you're gonna die because your cells don't replicate fast enough. But if you wanna do the thought experiment of Let's say a cell could live, even if it took a month to replicate the DNA and everything else about that person was normal, then theoretically, I think you would probably, uh, I don't know. I was gonna say based on telomeres, it would take longer for your tel telomeres to shorten. But um, as we're gonna see, a lot of aging is due, and as we already see in this course, um, a lot of aging is due to uh, reactive oxygen species. Um, though that oxidative damage plays a much bigger part in aging than the shortening of telomeres uh, does when we start to look at all the factors that build up. And we're gonna talk about how we actually, you know, make sure our telomeres don't shorten too much um, during replication. Yeah, good thought experiment on what would happen though. So let's look at telomeres now, bring it right into that. So we cannot replicate the five prime end of the lagging strand. So I'm saying that our polymerases, here's the five prime end of the ligand strand. We cannot make that into DNA. Why? Why can we not replicate the five prime, five prime end of a ligand strand? I'm just going to rewrite what it says on the bottom because I noticed that's cut off. Well, let's think about how this machinery works again, right? So for a polymerase to add nucleotides, you need some base to be there already. We cannot add DNA without some kind of starting platform. So imagine that, you know, we wanted to replace this RNA with DNA. So we come in and we delete all of that RNA. Then we would just have a gap here and there's no way to fill it because polymerase needs like a template that's starting over here to fill this in. And we don't have that, it's just air. So without a way to fix this, what would happen is that after every re replication cycle, your DNA would become shorter by the length of an RNA primer because a polymerase just can't get in there and replace it with DNA. So to fix that, we have specific enzymes. So at the end of our DNA are our telomeres, which is just like a thousand repeats of the same sequence. And it's usually rich in G. So for humans, it's T-T-A-G-G-G, -G -G, just repeat, 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 repeat. 
And the way to make that is we have what's called telomerase. And what telomerase is, it's a ribonucleoprotein. Let's break down that word. So that means ribonucleo RNA. So this is an RNA plus amino acids, ribonucleoprotein. You know, like your ribosome. Your ribosome is a ribonucleoprotein, right? And this is what makes telomeres and maintains your telomeres, um, the length of your telomeres. So what it is, it's just a, it has RNA that is um, complementary to our telomere sequence. So you can see here, it's that when we do this, it's gonna be some G, 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 T, T, G. So here we're making the sequence T, T, G, 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 T, T, G, then it's gonna repeat over and over and over again, right? So once we have this platform, our RNA primer can come in and start adding some, some sequence. And then we just do it again. And we're gonna keep stretching this out, 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 out to create this huge overstrand. And that's how we're gonna keep going and going and going. So we don't lose this part of the genome. We're just gonna keep making an overstrand, overstrand, overstrand. So you have like 100 to 300 nucleotides, just single strand overhang at the end of all your uh, genome there. If you lose telomerase, then your chromosomes will start getting smaller by this RNA primer amount every single time. So after one replication, you lose all this DNA. Then after a second replication, you're gonna lose all this DNA. Third replication, lose all this DNA because you keep shrinking by a primer every single time because we can't replicate it. And that's gonna eventually kill your cells. So the, the shrinking of telomeres does actually lead to the normal death of cells. And what can happen is if you have a cancer cell that never really shuts off this telomerase and allows this telomerase to continue to work, then that cell will never get the signal to stop growing and stop replicating. So having a superactive telomerase is again, uh, often found in cancer cells because your DNA is not naturally shrinking and the cell never gets the signal of, oh, my DNA has shrunk. My telomeres have shrunk rather, so I should stop replicating. I'm an old cell and I should be ready for cell death at that point. So that's how we can maintain our telomeres and that's how we actually synthesize the very end of our uh, proteins there. We're just left with this overhand over overhang of um, uh, DNA there. So any questions about that? You don't know you can find the slides? I thought I put them up like this afternoon. Let me double check. Or not this afternoon. I thought I'd put them up around 10 a.m. Well, apparently I did not. Let me guess, I put them in Biochem 1 instead. OK. 
right so give me one second i'll put them right up whatever class i put them in they're gonna freak out on me when they look at this material i'm gonna get messages from my gen chem class saying what is this stuff this is nonsense uh, this is 18th lecture or eight. All right, they are in the test floor folder right now. Whoops, didn't want to hit that button. There we go. All right, so moving on. So that's just the very basics of uh, eukaryotic DNA synthesis. Um, now we're going to get into the topic of DNA damage and DNA repair. So first we're just gonna look at how your DNA is damaged on a daily basis. Uh, one way that's especially devastating in the uh, state of Texas is the cyclobutylthymine dimers or TT dimers. Uh, what can happen is if in your DNA, you have two thymines that are just right next to each other in the same DNA strand. When UV radiation comes in, the two thymines will actually form a cyclobutyl ring with each other. This causes your DNA to distort because these, these thymines are no longer hydrogen bonding. They're just covalently bond to each other as shown here. And if these aren't treated, that's how you get melanoma. Now we do have ways to excise these uh, TT bases, um, which we'll go over, but that is just one common way uh, that your D, uh, DNA is damaged uh, inside your skin. And why it's important to wear sunscreen. Another type is oxidative uh, deamination. So damage from oxygen. Uh, we kind of touched on this and uh, metabolism, why oxygen is so bad. Um, but for chemical mutation, um, there's, there's two major classes that can happen from this. One, you can have a point mutation where one base is changed to another. Um, this is seen on, on the bottom uh, right here. Uh, so one question I always like to ask in Gen Chem is um, why does thymine exist and not uracil in DNA. And this is the reason, right? So cytosine, what can happen to cytosine and it happens all the time inside your cells is that cytosine will spontaneously go to uracil and it can be sped up by processes such as HNO2, which is found in prepared meats. So what happens is that cytosine is made to uracil. And let's say that the DNA was able to replicate. Well, uracil pa uh, uh, pairs with adenine. So instead of a base pair being C to G, you have now changed it to UA, or it will eventually become TA and in, in further iterations all due to changing that to an O. So the reason why we don't have uracil is because thymine right, has a methyl here instead. So that's how we can tell when we're going through the DNA. If we find a uracil, we know it must have been a cytosine. And then we can just cut out the uracil and put in the cytosine instead. Another type of mutation is shown here is uh, adenine can also do the same thing, 
but it is turned into a non-standard base called hypoxanathine. And this pairs with C. So there we went from A to T and eventually we're gonna go from G to C. So again, another type of mutation. And like I said, these, these are shown with different chemicals, but they also happen uh, spontaneously. You know, oxygen, free radicals will do this um, where it'll just change your bases. So that's oxidative deamination, right? You're removing your amine. So that's the deamin deamination is doing that with oxygen. So that's, that's what that word means there. So that's another type of common DNA damage we see. And the last major one that we're gonna look at is OxoG or 8-oxoguanine. And this comes from, again, oxygen. So these, um, these residues are created when a reactive oxygen species um, interacts with the guanine. It can also happen from these lovely uh, chemicals like mustard gas or ethyl nitros, nitros urea, MNNG. So just other chemicals will go and do this as well. And the problem with OxoG is that it can pair with C, but it can also pair with A, again, leading to this point mutation where instead of a G and C, you go to a T and an A. Um, and what also happens is that when you make OxoG, um, in this case, uh, O6-methylguanine, which is shown over here, which is something similar, um, when that is created, you're just going to lose your base, right? You're going to cut off that DNA. That will just happen spontaneously. And so, Inside each one of your cells, you have about 6,000 glycosidic bonds. So you have about 3,000 uh, DNAs, two strands of DNAs, basically for each chromosome, which makes 6 billion. And you lose about 20,000 each day in each cell due to this. And 20,000 sounds like a lot, but I mean, out of 6 billion, it's really not that much. And some research going into this, looking at um, a bunch of different review papers, uh, what they found is that um, if you have more 8-oxoguanine, um, that's really a marker for oxidative stress and cancer, right? So as the title uh, of the paper I have down there, um, you know, by breathing in different particulate uh, dust, ozone, um, all that inside your lungs, um, will cause an increase of 8-oxoguanine. So one way you could possibly look for the onset of cancer cells is just measure how much 8-oxoguanine is there in your lungs. The higher the levels, the more likely you're about to have cancer because all of this oxidative stress is happening. However, 8-oxoguanine, funny enough, is probably important with how we learn and remember stuff. In this, in our brain, we have uh, CPG islands. Um, if you don't remember what a CPG is, all that means is that it, it's a sequence of DNA that goes C, G, C, G, C, G. The P stands for phosphate, so that's what's connecting these, right? And in your brain, 62% of these are methylated. So we, we have methyls um, on there on our, on our uh, G residues. And what a methylation of CPG islands normally means, that means these genes won't be um, expressed. It's a way to silent genes uh, stably, right? Once the methyl's on there, it's not really gonna come out. However, during memory formation, during the process of learning, what happens in the hippocampus is that the CPG islands lose their methyl groups. And a uh, intermediate in this is the formation of 8-oxoguanine, right? So to demethylate these CPG islands, you actually create 8-oxoguanine. So 
It is a marker of stress, but it is also present when we're learning stuff. So um, right now, your brain is probably removing some methyls from CPGs to make some new connections or to turn on some genes rather. Um, and you're making this 8-oxoguanine. So you're looking at the thing you're making in your brain right now. Right, so any questions so far about um, our DNA damage? So when your DNA becomes changed, that is called a mutation. And one way that mutations can happen, uh, a certain type of mutations are insertions or deletions. So we either insert new bases or we delete bases. And that can happen due to intercalating agents. Um, these two agents are, are just chemicals. Uh, arsidine orange is used for labeling DNA and proflavin um, as well. And what these do, what an intercalating agent is, is that it goes and it base stacks between your DNA. If you don't remember what base stacking is from organic, um, carbon rings, right, will interact with other carbon rings and just form a stack. That's a very favorable interaction. And that's what's happening with intercalating agents. That's what an intercalating agent does. And when that happens, the gap between base pairs get really big, basically doubles. And the DNA at that location distorts. You have a local distortion of the 3D uh, DNA structure. And sometimes, due to that distortion, you might accidentally insert new um, nucleotides or you might accidentally delete nucleotides. However, just because a mutation happens doesn't mean it's not bad or will have any consequence. It's actually kind of random if it will have any consequences at all because you could have a mutation in the non-colden DNA, or you could have a mutation in a part of the genetic code that's copied somewhere else, um, right? Because we have two chromosomes, uh, or rather we have a copy of each chromosome. And so it could be possible that even though one chromosome gets mutated, the other one's okay, and you can function with just one copy. Um, some proteins do work that way, where um, if you're heterozygous for a working copy of a protein, you're still fine. Or you could hit something that doesn't affect protein at all, and you should be just, just fine. So there are, it is just random. Just because a mutation happens doesn't mean you're actually going to see it at all. However, 80% of the cancers we see in humans are due to... Um, uh, chemicals that do cause mutations. So they, they can have a big effect. They don't have to, but they can. And how do we know what a carcinogen is or not? And just, just keep this in mind when we're talking about chemicals right now, um, there's roughly 80,000 chemicals out in the market that are important for different processes. And, you know, we make about a thousand new ones each day. And we want to know if these chemicals cause cancer, if they cause DNA mutations. And so the way to do that uh, very well, to, to do it like, um, you know, the best you can without using humans is to use a mouse or a rat and just give them this chemical and see if they get cancer. Uh, unfortunately, that takes a lot of time and money to do valid tests. 
time and money people don't want to spend. So hardly any molecule actually goes through this good test. Instead, in the 70s, uh, a professor out at UC Berkeley, uh, who is named Ames, came up with the Ames test. So what he did there is that he uses bacteria to test for uh, whether a chemical will cause mutations in cancer or not. Uh, so he uses a type of uh, uh, salmonella that cannot uh, make histidine. So if you put them on a plate and you don't give them histidine, they die. And the test is you mix the bacteria with these chemicals. And what's being shown on this plate is like different areas have different levels of chemical. That's usually how these work. Or this could have like low levels, like medium levels, high levels, extremely high levels, something like that. It's just concentration based. And the idea is if this molecule causes mutations and you use like what, 10 to the ninth? So you use a um, hundred billion E. coli. So you spread 100 billion, not E. coli, salmonella on this plate. And the idea is if this is a uh, carcinogen, chances are one of those 100 billion will mutate to start making histidine. And then you just watch to see if colonies start to grow. The more colonies that start to grow, the more of a carcinogen it is and at what concentration they grow at too. Now, since we're trying to do tests for humans um, and humans have livers that can actually deal with a lot of carcinogens and make them so they don't harm us, uh, we also add proteins that are found in liver, in this case, rat liver, to account for our liver being, being able to take care of some of these mutagens. And what we find is that, you know, for this test, there's correlation with our rat test, right? 80% of the time, if we see it's a carcinogen in the Ames test, it's gonna be a carcinogen in our rat test. So that's why uh, there's actually US laws on the books where under the Pesticide Act, not ACE, the Pesticide Act, um, the Ames test is required to see if the pesticide is a carcinogen. And under the uh, Toxic Substance Control Act, this is one of the six tests you have to do to see if this substance is a carcinogen. Now, with all of that information, what is the limitations of the Ames test and saying if something's a carcinogen or not? Why might the Ames test not be so great at predicting carcinogens? So here's a possible hint. What organism would we care that this causes carcinogen, that this is a carcinogen to? That is, what organism do we really care about at the very end of this test? Us. Yes, uh, because mutations are not just bad, invisible and non-harming. Um, that is a limitation that possibly the mutations could cause something that, that um, it does cause mutations, but um, it didn't cause a harming one. What I'll say for that is um, since we're using a billion cells, um, the odds are if it causes mutations at all, the chance you're probably going to make a mutation that's bad, right? So that's why I was saying mutations are random. 
in that it's random that it will do something bad or random that it doesn't do so something at all or possibly something good in view of the organism. But yeah, one of the big problems with this is that we really care if this is gonna be a carcinogen to humans at the end of the day, right? That's what we're most uh, worried about. So where is that a problem in this test? Not just the bacteria. So take the bacteria out of the equation. That's a problem for a different matter. Whose liver are we using? To rats, right? A rat liver is not a human liver. They're different. They have different proteins. Um, so one way to improve on the AIMS test that people have done is to use human liver instead of rat liver. That actually gives better results. So that's, that's one, one limitation. This uses a rat liver, not a human liver. The other limitation uses prokaryotes. That's a big one. We have just learned through uh, DNA replication right there. Um, prokaryotes and eukaryotes are quite different. I mean, a lot of the things are the same. It's the same ideas, but they all use different systems. This is especially true uh, when we get to DNA repair. Prokaryotes and, and humans use different mechanisms. Um, so one way to improve on this that people have done as well, do this test with the yeast. At least there you're using a eukaryote. So the best way to do the AIMS test is yeast plus human liver. And that'll generally give you uh, more accurate results. All right, but any questions about uh, the AIMS test or anything up to this point? Right. So we've talked about DNA replication. We talked about um, DNA damage. So let's talk about how eukaryotes repair their DNA then. And excuse me, every single day in one of your cells, you have about a hundred thousand different DNA damages that happen in every cell. That's a lot. Um, either due to the environment or due to different metabolic processes. And these have to be repaired unless you want cancer to possibly start. So those pyrimidine dimers that we talked about, right? Usually those would be taken care of by what's called a DNA photolyase. And what a DNA photolyase does is it uses UV to go and uh, chop off the uh, DNA. So they have a, a light absorbing cofactor in FADH and they take in the light, make FADH minus, split that, um, uh, that that's a cyclobutane bond and now you have TTs back. Unfortunately, placental mammals, i.e. us, don't have this protein anymore. We lost it or, or a common ancestor rather never, never got it. So we can't use photolyase because we don't have it. We use nucleotide excision repair, which is a more error prone mechanism that we'll look over. But if we just look at how this uh, photolyase works and the reason why we're looking at it, even though humans don't have it is because um, we do have enzymes that work similar to this. And your protein, the protein here has a very positive charge on the surface of it. And it will bind to DNA because of that, because DNA is negative. And what happens is that you take these TT dimers and you actually like put it into the active site of the protein, which is being shown here. 
And here the purple and yellow are our cofactors. And since we have an empty part in the DNA, we actually have uh, amino acids go in there and fill in that empty cavity to act like the two thymines that were missing. Then UV comes in, cause FADH to become uh, negatively charged, free radical, and we use that energy to split the thymine thymine dimer. So that's how a photoligase can work, which again, uh, humans don't have access to. We use something like this, base excision repair. So we're gonna talk about how, how we can repair our DNA. Um, so if we come across DNA that uh, we don't, don't have the mechanisms to fix, uh, our solution is to cut it out and then replace it. And the way to cut it out to begin with uh, is called a glycosylase. Because if you remember, the thing that is connecting a bond to a sugar, that's called a glycosidic bond. That is the name of the bond connecting the base to the sugar. So a glycosylase lyases a glycosidic bond. So it's right there in the name, lyase, to cut. Cut the glycosidic bond. So we just have the sugar and no base. This is called an AP site or an A-basic site, a purinic site. So AP or A-basic. And shown on the left here, I just have the whole pathway of what will happen. Um, and we'll look at some of this, but basically once you have your AP site, you open up the DNA and chop it out, and then you just need to repair it. Um, either through uh, RNA, then flap, then ligase, or our polymerase can also do it. Here are all the glycosylases in our body. You don't need to uh, know the names of this, especially unknown. <laughs> we know it exists, but we don't don't actually we haven't actually uh, uh, created or or, or um, got it out, purified it yet. That's what I was looking for. Um, but yeah, here are just a bunch of them. And as as labeled here, once we have this AP site, we're just going to cut out the things around it, and then we're going to fill it in. That's our plan, cut it out and repair it, which is possible because we do have the other DNA strand, right? So that's, that's easy enough to do. So like I said, there are a lot of different glycosylases. So let's look at just one, it's called uracil DNA glycosylase. And what uracil DNA glycosylase does is that it removes uracils. Um, from your DNA. And we have copies of this in our nucleus, in our mitochondria. Um, and this question, how does uracil get in DNA again? So remember, C will go to U through oxidative deamination. And this enzyme should look very familiar to what we just talked about with the photolyase. What happens here is when we find a U, we'll flip out the UG base pair, because that used to be a C. We'll flip that out and put it into the glycosylase. There, we cut the uridine away. But we do not release the DNA. We, we hold the DNA to this glycosylase after we cut out the base because an AP site is actually toxic. That is um, topoisomerase. So topoisomerase is a um, enzyme that when you are replicating DNA, it will relieve the torsion on that DNA. And, you know, we talked about this in prokaryotes. That was called gyrase. Here's topoisomerase one. And if topoisomerase 1 comes across an AP site, it stops. It can't move. It's frozen. And then 
we cannot continue DNA replication, we have a big problem. So to make sure this doesn't happen, we hold the DNA to our glycosylase and just put arginine right there. And until we're able to excise that part of the DNA and fix it. Now, how does this glycosylase know a uracil is there? That's because UG base pair uh, causes, a, uh, causes the DNA structure to bend by 45 degrees. And so this uracil DNA uh, glycosylase, all it's doing is it's waiting for DNA to bend at that 45 degree angle. And it knows to uh, bind to that, right? And this enzyme has evolved to bind perfectly to that type of DNA distortion. And it'll only do it if it's due to uracil. So if you have the same kind of kink for whatever reason, and it's not uracil, this glycosylase won't bind. So you don't accidentally cut off uh, a different type of uh, nucleotide. It will only do it for uracil. So that's, that's one example of a glycosylase in action. Any questions about that? Right. Now let's actually look at removing nucleotides now, which is called nucleotide excision repair or NER. And it will remove bases. And this is how we can remove those thymine, thymine dimers. Tab uh, tobacco, uh, smoking will also cause uh, DNA damage that needs to be uh, removed uh, through these pro processes. Um, and these enzymes have horrible names, but at least they're called A, B, C, and D. So what happens is UVR, A, B, and C, they will combine to make an endonuclease. So originally, there are three individual proteins, and then they will come together to form and endonuclease. And what they do, as shown here, seven nucleotides away and either three or four nucleotides away from your error, they will cut the DNA. Cut here, cut here. The only thing holding this DNA in place now is, uh, is um, hydrogen bonds. So once ABC does its job of cutting, D comes in and it's a helicase and it'll just unwind the DNA. Once the DNA is unwind, since it's not connected to anything, the, uh, the error just flies off into the uh, nucleus, never to be seen again. Um, so it's gone. Then, well, Polymerase can come and fix it. Ligase can fill out any nick. And that's basically how we do our prepare, uh, our, our uh, repair of DNA. Cut, remove, replace. Cut, remove, replace. Carried out by ABC, then D, then polymerase one and DNA ligase. And if we do not have this mechanism, well, you're gonna have some different diseases. Uh, so one is called XP, xeroderma pigmentosum, and this is genetic if you have a defective uh, nucleotide excision repair. And when you have this, that means you cannot fix those TT dimers, which means you are extremely sensitive to sunlight and UV, and you have to be incredibly careful um, because... Um, what will happen is that uh, if exposed to UV, you can't fix it, right? So that will lead to skin dryness, a lot of freckles and cancer uh, as an infant. Another type of um, inherited disease is called CS. 
again, sensitivity UV. You also have certain growth, uh, neurological um, dysfunction, and premature aging is what that word says there on the bottom. And there is another one. Um, I didn't write it down, but that one's fatal before uh, uh, the fetus is even fully developed. So NER is um, very important because, like I said, it's how we fix our DNA damage. And you have 100,000 events in every cell every day. So this pathway really needs to work. Now, like in CS, if you do not have functioning NER pathways, uh, what happens in mice who are defective in this? They actually age incredibly fast and their lifespan is uh, really short. You also have deafness, um, retinal uh, degradation. Uh, you actually lose fat tissue and uh, your brain starts to uh, calcify. What's kind of scary along that is that um, if you take cells from a young person versus cells of an older person and you just measure the amount of NER uh, proteins in there, the young person will have more than the old person. So naturally, um, the amount of NER proteins we make over our lifetime decreases, which makes us more susceptible to things like cancer. Um, yeah, so uh, if you want to know more information about that, here's a uh, review article I just found in Nucleic Acids Research. Um, it's, it's old, 14 years old now, um, but from there you can probably see what articles have cited it and see if there's any new information about how these uh, DNA repair genes and proteins change as we get older, if you're interested in that topic. Right. Any questions uh, so far about uh, anything? All right. So it is about 140. So I think I'm going to call it here. Um, just as a final reminder. Um, test three is on Tuesday. If you have any questions about that at all, um, please let me know. Otherwise, I will put up a homework. Remember, you have two parts due next week, Thursday. No homework due this Tuesday. Um, yeah, that's all I have for you. So hopefully you learned something interesting today that you can share with your friends and family. I'm sure they all love to hear all about how as they age proteins just go away that are meant to protect you. Um, but with that, I will see everybody in what, seven, like 10 days from now on the 20th. This is the next time our live lecture is. So take care until then. Good luck and see you then. Have a good one.